Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It's wonderful to have you here this afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and we've all been looking forward to this event this afternoon. We're very honored that Susan Smith, who is the president of the League of Women Voters of Michigan, um, and she's also the moderator for today's program, asked the Ford School to work together with the League to host this special event today. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization which sponsors candidate forums to help raise policy awareness through education and advocacy. And that really is an important service for our community, and so we're delighted to be partnering with them. I'd also like to acknowledge Professor John Chamberlain, who helped to connect the League and the Ford School. In addition, um, it's my pleasure to recognize the student organizations that are assisting us and working with us today. And in particular, they are the Domestic Policy Corps, the Rackham Student Government, and the Students of Color at Rackham. And so we're delighted to have representatives from each of those organizations here with us. Well, of course, today's event wouldn't be possible if our candidates were not willing to join us this afternoon. And so it's wonderful to have Regent Kathy White, Ambassador Ron Weiser, Rob Steele, and Mike Beam. Thank you all for joining us. We will um, be introducing you more formally in just a few moments. So Susan Smith will do those introductions. Um, but I would like to remind our audience who are watching live on live web stream that you can tweet your questions into us. Please use the hashtag Regents. Re I'm sorry, Regents Forum is the hashtag. And for those of you who are in the audience, you should have received cards. There will be volunteers who will be coming down the aisles to collect your cards for the question part of the session, which of course is so important. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Susan Smith. Thank you, Dean Collins, and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. The League is pleased to be having this opportunity to co-sponsor this forum, along with the Ford School and the student organizations. The League is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support or oppose candidates or parties. I would like to take just a minute to introduce the candidates, and then I will explain the format we're going to be using this afternoon. Uh, we have Mike Beam first on my left, Ron Weiser, I'm sorry, start, failed already, Rob Steele, Ron Weiser, and Kathy White. They will have an opportunity, each of them, to make an opening remark, and then we will have the questions, and then at the end we will, they will have an opportunity to make closing remarks. The order in which they make the opening remarks and the closing remarks was predetermined by drawing from a hat. Uh, before you all arrived. We have timers here from the League this afternoon to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to speak. So 15 seconds before the time is up, uh, the League member will hold up that sign and then at the end, the stop sign. And after that, a hook comes out from the <laughs> side and we drag them off. I'm sure everybody will observe the time limit. Questions are important, and I believe you were given cards when you came in. Please fill them out, and uh, students will come around and, and pick those questions up and give them to our screening committee, which is sitting down here in the front of the room. The screening committee is made up of representatives from the league and the student organizations, and the, that's uh, so that we can avoid duplication of, of questions. And as Dean Collins pointed out, uh, if you want to tweet your questions, you can do so, and those questions will also be uh, submitted to the review committee. We have an hour and 15 minutes. I will ensure that the time limits are observed, and I'm pleased then that we are going to begin the first opening statement with Mr. Steele. Thank you all for uh, the opportunity to be here at the Ford School and uh, all the other groups that are helping to sponsor this along with the League of Women, Women Voters. My name is Dr. Rob Steele. And uh, I guess for my brief introduction here, uh, I'll just make the comment that when you look at the Board of Regents, there's eight members and they all should bring different strengths and weaknesses so they can cover for each other and make sure that the university activities are covered. Um, I graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School when I was 23 years old, served 20 years on the faculty at the university in charge of a major rotation, so very involved in medical education. 
uh, in my private practice out at St. Joe's. I helped found that practice, 320 employees, ran finance and benefits, so I have some experience there. Uh, and also, we've been engaged in clinical research, and I've been literally involved in dozens and dozens of research projects. And since the budget at the university is $6.9 billion and the health center is $3.6 billion, I will bring an absolute unique qualification to the team there at the board. Thank you. Mr. Weiser. My name is Ron Weiser, and I'm running for regent. I am running for one term. Uh, I'm running because I think I can make a difference. I've been involved with the university since 1963 when I started school here. And 25 years later, I became heavily involved with the university. I was able to help initiate three major programs and work peripherally on others, and I'm happy to talk about that later on. But I believe that I can make a difference. I believe the biggest problem facing the university now is the unrelenting growth in tuition and how that can be reduced without reducing the excellence and tradition of the university is one of the major problems that is faced in the future, and I think I bring the, the qualifications to help the university, help guide the university in finding solutions to that problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Beam? Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Beam. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank Dean Collins, and I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Smith for moderating here today. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, my office is up in, uh, in Flint, in the middle part of the state. I graduated from the university here with a BA in English in 1989 uh, and uh, graduated from Wayne State uh, in 1992 from law school. In my 23 years as being an attorney, uh, I, I've sort of founded a lot of my practice on finding consensus with people. In addition uh, to being an attorney, uh, I founded, I'm a chairperson of a group called Business Forward. And uh, basically what Business Forward does is takes local voices uh, to Michigan and from Michigan to Washington, D.C. Uh, and lets Washington know uh, our thoughts on how to increase uh, our economical recovery. Uh, I think that's important in a place like the University of Michigan with the Open Meetings Act. Uh, and that's something we'll talk about and how to bring more voices. And also the top issue I'm sure we'll discuss is affordability and accessibility uh, here at the university. And so uh, those, I think, would be my top two priorities, and I'm willing to discuss them today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. White? Thank you. And I want to thank everyone who's put this together today. It's a wonderful opportunity to speak to all of you. My name is Kathy White. I'm the current chair of the University of Michigan Board of Regents. And my top priority has always been to maintain and improve the educational and institutional quality at the University of Michigan on all three campuses, Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn. And with such quality education, it is important to keep the University of Michigan affordable. And as the relative amount of state funding has decreased, um, uh, policies to keep the University of Michigan affordable have to be in place. And uh, the reason why affordability is so important is because we have to have students from all different backgrounds with different perspectives who are in an environment that is an enriching academic uh, environment through which they can engage with each other and share ideas. And during my tenure on the board, um, the University of Michigan has increased financial aid commensurate with any tuition increase for in-state students. Thank you. All right, we'll turn then to the questions and the first person to answer will be Mr. Beam, and here's the question. What challenges will the university be facing in the next 10 years, and how would you address them? Well, I think first, we've all mentioned it. It's uh, affordability and accessibility. I, I group those two items together because I think they go together. Uh, when you uh, talk about affordability, and just look at things like what Pell Grants used to cover uh, Two and a half decades ago, a Pell Grant covered roughly 80% of school for uh, a student, uh, and now at only 25%. Uh, so I think one of the things that's occurred, uh, there's a study uh, out uh, two years ago that talks about in Michigan, 39% of students, uh, of college students at the universities, public and private in Michigan, uh, receive uh, need-based loans, uh, but only 13% here at the University of Michigan receive need-based loans. I think that's reflective of uh, two things. Um, the university uh, not, uh, well, 
it, it needs to increase the picture in the group of students that come here to Michigan to make uh, an opportunity here and make a college education affordable so we're not, when we graduate, looking over our shoulders uh, for fear of uh, you know, heading into bankruptcy. Uh, the university uh, produces students and the students should be able to move into the job market without looking over uh, their shoulder. Uh, so I think that's an extremely important uh, issue here and there are a couple ways we need to go about it. One uh, that I would look at would be uh, if we can't get more money from the state to look at uh, loaning uh, money to students from the university here. Thank you. Dr. Steele, challenges and how would you address them? I think we'll all agree that uh, access and, and uh, affordability are two. I'll throw one in after I make a comment on afford affordability and access. Uh, the, the, uh, when you want to compare whether or not it's affordable, just look at a part-time job. It used to be when I was in school, you could have a part-time job and pay for school. That's obviously gone by the wayside. Accessibility is a disaster for students from the state of Michigan. 46% of the students are now from out of state. State of Michigan taxpayers have invested billions and billions and billions of dollars. We have students with perfect SAT scores from the state of Michigan who are not accepted. That's intolerable. These students leave the state. They never return. The state of Michigan has gotten older faster than Florida. We have more people under age 40 leaving the state than any other state in the union. So we need to make sure our qualified students get in. Affordability will take care of it a couple different ways. For three years, I've campaigned on the great job that the administrators and donors like Ambassador Weiser have done in creating this endowment to use the endowment as the bank for student loans rather than federal funds to help restrain tuition and align the interests of the donors, the students, the university, and the educational project product they receive. Another big thing is this buildings. I know uh, people who run a business know they don't close it for four months out of the year. We should sell the tuition in the summertime cheaper. We should get our students in on a cut rate discount tuition to get them through school faster with less debt and fewer housing costs and help reduce the, or help change the dynamic of the capital cost structure of the university by using the buildings 12 months out of 12 instead of eight. Thank you. Mr. Weiser. Well, the question was what the problems are, not necessarily the solutions, and I think there are many solutions to the issues that face the university, and I believe that's what the responsibility of the regents are, is to make sure that the university is adhering to its mission, that the major strategies are in place to advance that mission, and that the university's officers and uh, deans and others in the faculty are in, are heading towards that strategy and making sure that it, that strategy is being utilized for the, purpose it, w the purposes for which they were intended. Uh, once that can be done and accomplished, then each of the challenges that all of these, these two gentlemen have talked about, and I believe that Kathy will talk about, can be addressed. Uh, there are many, many different ways to look at the affordability issue. Uh, the budget of the university, uh, and we can talk about state of Michigan cuts, but forgetting everything else, it's grown so much more rapidly than inflation over the years. It's made a huge difference in the lives of not just the students when they graduate with this heavy debt, but with their families and the burden put on families to, uh, for students to afford to be able to come to this great university. So solutions have to be found to that, and there are many. And uh, I have literature out. You can look at my website. I mean, some of those are solutions, but those are just ideas. And in the end run, it has to be the leadership of the university, the president and the officers and the deans who are able to bring about the change that will be necessary, and it won't be easy. Thank you. Ms. White, challenges over the next 10 years, how would you address them? Well, I think it's unanimous. Uh, we all think accessibility and affordability in the near term, and certainly uh, even 10 years, is going to be the, one of the greatest challenges. Uh, what the board has done thus far, um, we have, along with the administration, we're raising a billion dollars in uh, f financial aid or it's scholarships and, and fellowships for students. We've already raised uh, 440 million of that. So I, th I think we're on track to do that, and hopefully we can do even more. This endowment would, of course, sustain the ability to continue to provide the financial aid at a higher level to make things uh, more affordable for our students. Also, um, I'm a big proponent of trying to get um, veterans to be um, coming to our university as well. Um, uh, they provide a lot of different perspective, and uh, I spearheaded the move to have them get in-state tuition because sometimes they have a um, 
their benefits are tied to having in-state tuition. We want to make the place more accessible for veterans as well. There's a lot of different um, ways in which we can continue to work on cost cutting. Uh, we've cut $289 million to the base budget since 2004, and another $120 million are, is going to be cut uh, between the period of 2007 to 2013. Um, I'm sorry, 2013 to 2017, another $120 million. And in the budget for this year is $24 million in cuts to the base budget. So, um, and the other, I have to stop. You got me just in time. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, the first person to answer this question, the, the next question will be Dr. Steele, and it has to do with diversity. What does a diverse U of M look like to you? Is that important? How would your opinion on diversity frame your approach to being a regent? Well, certainly diversity is important. That's been recognized by many different groups who have studied higher education. Uh, we also have to take into account that diversity means many different things. Uh, we do know from the voters in the state and various uh, changes to the current Constitution, the Supreme Court has ruled that race-based uh, aspects of diversity it cannot be a sole determinant, so that issue is, is kind of directly out of our hands. Uh, I agree with Regent White. One of the things that I've campaigned on uh, in, to help improve diversity is to recruit veterans on the GI Bill to get a more mature group of students, a group of students that have uh, discipline and have uh, planning in, their, in, in how they do things, and I, I think that's critical. Um, there's, there's no question that diversity encompasses many different things. My, my daughter is a freshman at the University of Chicago, and during their orientation session, they, they, uh, during their uh, week-long orientation, one of, the, one of the things they did in some of their various uh, questionnaires was about people's attitudes. And at the University of Chicago, there were 6% of the students that self-identified them as conservatives and 40-some uh, percent that identified themselves as liberals. So we, we know we have a, an issue with diversity on that as well. But we need to fix K through 12 if we want to improve the, the strong issue that we have with uh, affirmative action type diversity. And one thing the university absolutely can do for this pool of students is be far more aggressive with their grants and stipends. We're competing against Stanford and Harvard, and we have to be able to say to these few students who are available, you're in, and there's no cost attached. Thank you. Mr. Weiser. Given the, the constraints of the Constitution, Michigan Constitution, and the laws that are in place, the university has to strive to find ways to have a diverse population of students here because it enhances the educational experience. It creates greater opportunities for research and the interaction of research. There's many, many reasons why that's important. Finding a way to do that is really a charge of the regents and the executive officers. Diversity in economic background quite often can bring about diversity of other types. And whether it's a poor family from the Upper Peninsula or a poor family from the city of Detroit or Flint or Muskegon or Lansing or Ann Arbor for that matter, uh, having the ability to bring, not only bring students here yeah. in a way where they can afford this university and understand and their families understand they can afford this university, but, and, and also to leave without a huge burden, uh, but also those students have to be brought here in a way where they can be, if they are not adequately prepared, because quite often the, the backgrounds, the less economic disadvantaged backgrounds, means they don't have the educational background to succeed here or the environmental background. We need to make sure that not only do we have diverse students, but they have the opportunity to succeed here. There's nothing worse than having a student come and then fail. All right, thank you. Ms. White? Yes, diversity is extremely important, all types of diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, along with uh, people with disabilities, which, um, which I'm really focused on lately to make sure that we're including uh, people with disabilities in our definition of diversity. And socioeconomic diversity is very important because when you are faced with learning in a classroom environment, the way in which you can um, understand from other perspectives, the challenges that are happening for other people um, means that you're going to have a better ability to face and tackle ill-structured problems that are very difficult to find solutions to. And you want to start by having students learn early 
that people who are different from them can provide a perspective that they're not familiar with. And so diversity is extremely important. Uh, one way we have to continue to do uh, a lot of the diversity, of course, is making uh, the university affordable, which we've already talked about. But also we are challenged with making sure we have enough outreach um, uh, to, to encourage students who are very well qualified to come here, that they can afford it, and that they should come here, and that this is an open place that is tolerant and is welcoming and wants to have the most talented students it can um, at, at this university. And so we need to continue to do more, and I'm committed to do that. Thank you. Mr. Beam? Uh, these two issues are intertwined, affordability and accessibility. And what I mean by that is if you cannot afford tuition, then the university is not accessible to you. Um, also from a racial standpoint, uh, I believe if you took a picture of the state of Michigan and the people in it, uh, this is a state university and the picture of the student body should reflect the state. Uh, we need to improve that. Uh, you know, for example, there's 14% African American population in the state of Michigan. There's 4% here at the university. Uh, that needs to be fixed. Like everyone's talked about, uh, there are ways to go about this within uh, the Gratz and Grutter decisions uh, that the university now has to, uh, you know, abide by. Um, the economic issue, I mentioned those uh, numbers, about 13% of the students here are receiving uh, need-based grants, and 39 across the state. Um, that is a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, like everyone's mentioned, um, you see these students. I'm a big brother, for example. I have two little brothers who are in fifth grade. They're absolutely smart enough to eventually come to school here, but they don't have the tools, and the, they're not afforded the ability to get those tools. And I think we really need to look into potential outreach programs from the university and from the three branches, I see the students at U of M Flint quite often, and they are looking forward to, or they're looking into an outreach program into the local students. I think that's a way to prepare the students to attend school here. Thank you. Mr. Weiser, you'll be first this time, and the question has to do with sexual assaults. What can Michigan do to improve its responses to sexual assaults on campus? What policies would you support to change the culture on campus to help prevent sexual violence and to make our community safer for all students? Well, the policies have to be developed by a combination of the university leadership as well as the students together because I think the students themselves will have the best input as to what they feel they need in order to prevent this, these horrendous acts from continuing. And we know they're continuing. We know the high percentages of, of rapes and other types of uh, aggressive behavior that have taken place on campus, not just this campus, but campuses across the United States. So I believe it's the job of the regents of the university to encourage a dialogue between the executive leadership, the deans, the students, the student leadership, to find solutions that will work for everyone. I mean, you can come up with different ideas, but those are the tactics. And quite frankly, the regions aren't responsible for tactics. They're responsible for making sure that the strategies that are necessary to accomplish this goal are in place, and that the tactics that are necessary to fulfill those desires of the students and of their parents and of the university as a whole are being implemented. So I, I, didn't give an, I didn't give any answers as to specific things because I don't think that's the responsibility of a region. I believe that has to come from a different place. Thank you. Ms. Wayne? The problems of sexual assault on campuses across the country, as well as on this campus, is a very, very serious matter. And the policies in place um, have to be looked at constantly to make sure that they not only help with preventing sexual assault from happening again, but also to make sure that there's um, education and there's a, a way for the students who have been um, assaulted and harmed by this to get counseling and are able to uh, receive treatment. 
Also, one of the things that is really important to help prevent um, these issues is bystander intervention. And culture change on campus to make sure that people um, understand that it's all of our responsibility, not just the individuals, but all of our responsibility to help prevent uh, sexual harassment and sexual um, assault from occurring. Uh, and the regents, um, their role is, again, as Ambassador Weiser said, it's not to handle the tactics, but it is to provide an, an environment where uh, innovative ideas and support can come, funding can come, to help tackle these very difficult issues. Alcohol and drugs um, often are coincide with sexual violence, and so we have to not only tackle the uh, sexual assault issues, but also dealing with some of the alcohol issues as well. And that's part of a policy issues that uh, the board would have to engage in. Thank you. Mr. Beam. I think first and foremost, uh, the environment needs to change. Um, there are across college campuses, this isn't a problem that's just, you know, here at U of M on campus. Uh, it's across all college campuses. Um, and you can't ignore this problem. I think too many times the survivor of the assault uh, is made to feel ignored, uh, made to feel that uh, they should be quiet and not pursue this. Uh, the university, first and foremost, uh, needs to put a plan together to protect the rights uh, of the survivor of the assault. Uh, and, and the voice of that survivor needs to be heard. I think once a policy like that is put in place, then the environment changes. Uh, and like everyone's mentioned, uh, policies need to go into place uh, where things like that, you would know beforehand uh, what will occur. I think too many times uh, in this day and age, people either consciously or subconsciously have the feeling that um, nothing will occur uh, if something like this happens. Uh, the assault, uh, the person who's making the assault feels as though not much will occur and uh, the survivor after the assault uh, feels that way, uh, the same, that nothing will occur, so why should they do something about it? We do need to do something about it. We need to address it, bring it into the light, and fix this problem. Thank you, Dr. Steele. With any major problem, uh, in the medical field, you always need robust data. You can't make a decision until you have robust data, and I think there is uh, certainly an undercurrent of concern over this issue. There is a problem. There is no question there's a problem. Uh, but the raw data and the, and the data involved in, a, in the true nature of the problem, the scope of the problem, and how the problem needs to be addressed I, is, is clearly lacking. The problem has exploded since the recent famous May letter from the Department, Office of Civil Rights Department of Justice Department of Education. And clearly the response at many of these universities has been problematic. You know, that, that incredible conservative Alan Dershowitz and Charles Ogletree just uh, published a, uh, an op-ed in the Boston newspaper castigating the Harvard policy, which is almost identical to ours, which they felt totally left the, quote, accused without any rights whatsoever. So we have a difficult act here. There is no question. I think one way to help, which may be a tactic, I think there's no question. I have a great concern about a campus-run, campus reporting line of, uh, of uh, a reporting with campus police. I think it causes the opportunity that maybe uh, interests aren't aligned and that sometimes people don't want to report. I mean, certainly the administrators don't want to be reporting more. Certainly someone who's reporting a problem doesn't want to be reporting, and I think the university needs to look into hiring outside, uh, legal, uh, outside uh, enforcement, whether it's the city, county, or state, and get out of the business of having their own campus police force. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, first answered by Ms. White, and has to do with including students in university decision-making. In February 2011, the regents voted to delete the section, quote unquote, student input in a university decision making from their bylaws. In July 2013, the regents formed a presidential search advisory committee and did not include student representation on it. As a regent, how will you solicit student input? What will you do to better ensure students are a part of the university's decision making process? Well, I actually had to do this, so I had to um, 
deal with this because I'm on the board and was part of the decision not to put students on the Presidential Search Advisory Committee um, and had to um, work very well with the students to make sure that their input was heard. Our decision to do that was because we needed to keep the um, committee relatively uh, small so it was manageable. The uh, we, there were a lot of groups we didn't have on the search committee. We had mainly Ann Arbor faculty. But we did work with the students. Um, the president then, Mike Proppy, was uh, very helpful along with Bobby Deschel, who's the current president at CFSG. They got a survey that was incredible that took into account all student views of what they were looking for in a president. And I think we actually were able to find one that had uh, uh, most of their concerns uh, um, addressed and so what you have to do is to engage the students early on talk about how to make sure that their views do get heard talk with the student leaders and have them work out ways that we can do the outreach and stay in constant contact and communication with the students the students will tell you exactly what they want just listen that's been my experience thank you mr. beam I think uh, this is a very important issue. It goes hand in hand with the uh, Open Meetings Act uh, issues that have come up this, uh, in the past and the litigation this summer. Um, I think there are some constitutional constraints here in Michigan uh, due to the, uh, the Constitution we have and how it's created the boards. Uh, and so you would need an amendment or a constitutional convention, many people say, to add uh, someone as a regent. That being the case, and with how well our legislators get along with one another in Lansing, uh, I don't know that that would occur. Uh, so if uh, I was voted uh, in as a regent, I would uh, regularly meet uh, with students. If the CSG wanted to uh, put a group together to advise, I would want to meet with them regularly. Uh, I would also uh, extend that to other, other issues that have come up from supporters of the athletic department, faculty members, also members uh, at the two branch campuses. I think they all have voices that need to be heard. Uh, I mentioned my involvement with uh, Business Forward because it, it's very similar to this. Uh, sometimes you know, we see politicians in Washington, D.C. sort of act in a bubble uh, and not make informed decisions. Uh, they need more voices. It's the same uh, here with the board. Uh, if the board hears more voices and interacts with more voices, I think it'll make more informed uh, decisions. Thank you. Dr. Steele? Thank you, Mike, for that question, wherever you are sitting. Um, I was actually the nominee for uh, uh, this position in the last election as well, and one of my big uh, issues at that time was what has now been proven to be a big issue with the lawsuits over the Open Meeting Act. I proposed at that time three years ago regular public office hours. And these public office hours wouldn't just be for faculty, students, administrators, and anyone else. It could also be for the residents of the city and the city administrators, because if there's a problem that we have with, with uh, transparency and accountability here at the University of Michigan, it also has to do with the relationship between the university and the city. So uh, I will have regular, open, regular scheduled office hours. So the students will certainly be welcome to come in there. I'll also, knowing that the taxpayers support this university, imagine if the governor, the attorney general, secretary of state, and your two U.S. senators had no way that you could get to them on a regular basis. It's unconscionable. I'll also have regular open office hours throughout the state, rotating through congressional districts every month. And this isn't just for Republicans and Democrats only. This is for everyone. We know that Republicans and Democrats, particularly at the K-12 and moving into the university level, we agree on all these issues, affordability, access. We want our kids to have the best, and we want them to stay here in the state of Michigan so that we're not chasing our grandkids all over the state. So um, I'll be welcomed and uh, ready to meet with the students because I'll have regular public office hours here and throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weiser. Well, my wife says this quite often. She's on the State Board of Education. Quite a, unfortunately, at times we forget that schools, and the university is a school, is about the st students and not about the adults. And if it is about the students, then their input in their own futures I think is important because without that input, we will be guiding them the way that we think it should be rather than necessarily, not, and not necessarily in what they need. 
or feel that they need. Now, I understand that adult the people who've been around longer, as I have, supposedly have more experience and know more, but the world has changed so rapidly what those needs are and what the kids want to have as their educational experience, which will allow them to go forth from this university and help change the world, may not be what we think it is. And so that input is important. And as a regent, I believe that it's important that we support and make sure that the leadership of the university has the processes in place to make sure that all of the areas of the university, whether it be a, a professor or a dean or a vice president or the president of the university, whoever the leadership is, has the opportunity and the students have the opportunity to have the input before decisions are made. Thank you. Mr. Beam, you'll be first to answer the next question. It has to do with climate change. Do you support the U of M divesting from fossil fuels and what should be the university's response to climate change? I do support that. Um, it's interesting just in the past few weeks how many politicians uh, dodge that question by saying I'm not a scientist, but then they're more than willing to give an opinion on the Ebola problems that we've seen. Uh, so. Uh, it can't be something that's just convenient. Uh, I think climate change is a fact. Uh, and when it comes to economics and policy like that, there are so many jobs that can be uh, produced uh, from uh, looking at climate change and making some corrections and getting away from fossil fuel dependency. Uh, when I have a family that lives up in the middle of the state and you see many of the windmills uh, in the wind farms uh, there, and that's just one you know, small example. Uh, so I do think we need to uh, divest from fossil fuels. Uh, I think it is a job maker. And I think uh, a place like the University of Michigan, uh, like it's doing, it should get out and lead on this issue uh, versus uh, trailing behind. Thank you. Dr. Steele? The answer is no, absolutely. I would not divest from fossil fuels. In fact, I am a scientist, and the data on this issue is not robust. When a theory is proved wrong, it takes only one small piece of data. When Einstein's theory was recently proved not to be quite accurate, it was the most minute piece of data that you could possibly comprehend in the world of physics, but yet it proved the theory wrong. And what we have seen over and over and over is that we have no predictable model yet. We have no predictable theory. We do know we have an issue that needs study and careful attention. There's no question about it. Um, but the answer is no. Uh, we, you know, we should be a leader in doing research. We should be a leader in coming up with solutions that are environmentally sustainable regardless of what the issues surrounding climate change are. Because we want to have uh, efficient energy use in a sustainable environmental policy regardless of the final answer on climate change. But it's clear with 18 years of no warming that it is not a proven theory. There's just no question about it. Thank you. Mr. Weiser? Well, the university, as we all know, is one of the leading research institutions, not just in the country, in the world. And so solving these problems of making sure that we have adequate, adequate energy supplies for ourselves, our families, and the population of this country and the world is one of the biggest challenges we face. And so one of the things we can do to solve this problem is to invest here in the university in research and focus on research that will determine ways that this problem can be solved. I'm not quite sure what divesting from fossil fuels mean. Does that mean that we sell, ask the, that we ask the, if they have it, if we ask the endowment to sell their Detroit Edison stock? who is burning fossil fuels but also creating windmills at the same time? Is that what we do? So they don't have the capital to clean up their fossil fuel uh, facilities until substitutes can be found? So I'm not quite sure what the purpose of that is. And it ha it, doing these things on a cross-the-board basis is never a good solution. I think the university has to make wise investments, but on the other hand, to, make think, to, to do things across the board when the real goal is to find solutions is not the best way to accomplish that goal. Ms. White? 
Well, I do believe climate change is a real problem, and I think that it's very important that we um, tackle it as a nation, as well as uh, having universities do research to improve the way we get energy so it doesn't harm the environment as substantially as fossil fuels do. I do not think it, divesting from fossil fuels um, in the endowment um, at this point makes sense. University of Michigan has uh, divested in two situations. One was against South Africa to protest the devastating and degrading segregation policies of South Africa, and the other was in um, tobacco products, which uniformly everyone agrees is a, they're very unhealthy and uh, it has created a lot of health problems in our society. And there's no doubt that climate change is a real problem and that eventually you know, we've got to do something because it's really going to affect us. The question is, does divesting um, our portfolio make sense at, that, at this point? And I have the same issue that M the Ambassador Weiser has, which is, what does it mean? Because a lot of the same companies that are um, doing a lot of the fossil fuel problems are also investing in green energy. Also, the other problem is our entire global economy is tied up in uh, fossil fuels. And it just is not something that we are all, as a, a global um, uh, community, settled on, whereas I think we were all settled that segregation and slavery was bad. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Steele, you will be first to get the next question, and it has to do with the city of Detroit. With growing national and international attention given to the city of Detroit and the university proximity, 45 minutes west, and roots originally founded in the city, what expanded role can and should the university play in the city of Detroit? Well, the university should play a large role. Uh, you know, one of the main things the university needs to do is get a better return on investment to the taxpayers in the state of Michigan, whether that's through helping Detroit or helping get our kids into school and then staying in the state and helping create a vibrant future economy. Because as Regent White was just mentioning, as regards energy is the way to solve poverty, uh, keeping the young, motivated people here with a good education is the way that we're going to solve all the problems. We've seen in Detroit right now a real renaissance with rapidly escalating rents in certain pockets of the city where the highly educated young people are actually going there and doing incubation and startup uh, companies. And so the university right now, the key thing they can do to help it in the university is through the K through 12 educational process. It's completely broken there. It's out of control. And, uh, you know, they haven't had a, a college-ready student come from hundreds, 200, I think it's 280 different high schools in the state of Michigan have not had a college-ready student in over 20 years. And so the University of Michigan can do a great deal by helping to foster both the, technolo the, the technological and economic startup things through the business school at the public policy school here, but then also through the education school and making sure that the K through 12 problem is fixed there with creative solutions that aren't uh, tied to, you know, old ways that have proven not to work and been broken. And that's one of the key things on the Board of Regents is we need to make sure we're answering to the solution to the problem and not to constituencies. Thank you. Mr. Weiser? Detroit's an important part of our state. And trying to help Detroit is important. Um, it's convenient because they're close, as it was pointed out. But do we tell the, the citizens and the people of Pontiac and Flint and Muskegon and Marquette? I mean, people have been suffering in the Upper Peninsula for a long time also. Do we tell them that the university does, cares more about Detroit than about them? Uh, yes, I think it's a good opportunity for our students because it's close and our students can go there and interact in the kinds of organizations that are helping it in, it in, um, helping in Detroit. Uh, the Ginsburg Center has a number of people who interact with, with, with Detroit kids, uh, with Detroit problems, but Detroit is not the only place we have problems in this state. And we do have a duty and responsibility not only to the rest of the country and the world, but especially to this state because we are a state institution. So, yes, we should, to the extent that we can, and the extent we have the resources, and the extent that students have the uh, have the willingness and the focus to be able to be involved in De Detroit, it's a great opportunity for us. But let's not forget the rest of the state. Thank you, Ms. White. Well, Detroit is not only an important city in the state of Michigan; it's an important city for the nation and the world because it was basically 
the birth of how we were going to do a middle class in this country. And so the University of Michigan should be very committed to the city of Detroit. The K through 12 situation is probably the best way in which we can um, have some effect. The important thing, though, is that the university, when we engage, we engage invited in areas in which we are welcome. We, we can work in partnership. Um, there has been some concern that uh, University of Michigan is taking over the city of Detroit, and uh, we have to be very careful that we don't do that. I actually work at Wayne State University, and uh, so uh, it's important that we realize there are other institutions as well that um, are involved in the city of Detroit, but we should definitely use our expertise in ways that especially our ability to do a lot of research in areas that maybe some of the other institutions in the state are not able to do or are not currently choosing to do. We should be involved in the city of Detroit. Thank you, Mr. Beam. I agree with what um, many of us have said so far on this issue. Uh, I think it comes down to outreach, uh, and I would add uh, this to the same extent with the branch campuses in Flint and Dearborn. Uh, I think many of the students uh, here on campus uh, can uh, serve as mentors <coughs> to young students. Uh, when you see, when young students see someone who has uh, made it to college and is successful in college, it provides a huge uh, boost to that young student. Uh, many students uh, that have never seen anyone that's gone, to, you know, that is in college or has been to college, uh, they don't see uh, as it being a possible goal. So I think there's a lot of potential there. But I think in issues uh, like Regent White said uh, that it needs to be in an area where we are invited uh, to pursue. But things like urban planning, revitalization, uh, the School of Education here uh, with outreach programs uh, to the students uh, in Detroit uh, makes a huge uh, difference. And I think there are many voids right now where we would not be stepping on toes, so to speak, but would provide uh, a lot of great uh, you know, skills uh, to these young students uh, in the K through 12 uh, areas. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Weiser, you'll be first this time, and this question has to do with shared services as a way of reducing costs. What is your opinion on shared services? What other possible methods of cost control can the university employ? Should the university be attempting to lower cost, or will that inevitably compromise educational quality? The University of Michigan is. Uh, I at one time had the opportunity to, win in a, to work in a much bigger bureaucracy than the University of Michigan. It was called the State Department. And uh, bureaucracies are not much different any place in the world. Um, they are not inherently efficient. Um, there is opportunities for changing the cost and the, without reducing the quality. Uh, that can involve a lot of things. I have an accounting background. I have a business background. I have a finance background. I took every accounting course the university had, graduate and undergraduate, when I was here, and uh, it served me well. Uh, but that process is a long-term process because it's a cultural change. And changes in the way that we budget, which is essentially stovepipe budgeting, uh, top-down and not bottom-up budgeting. Uh, there are a lot of things that have to be changed, but it takes change. That change is a cultural change that takes the leadership of the university to, and the people who are going to be affected by that change to all be a part of. So it's not easy. It's slow, but it can be accomplished. Can you save 3% in a bureaucracy? Can you save 5%? Those things are all possible. So. Uh, there are a lot of techniques, as I said. There are a lot of, and, and there are a lot of, uh, of uh, different ways to approach these problems. But yes, you can cut cost without uh, without reducing excellence. In fact, you can cut cost and use that money to increase excellence. Thank you, Ms. White. Well, the University of Michigan may be the most decentralized organization on the planet. Um, uh, but decentralization has brought the academic excellence to this institution because people are able to control um, a little bit better how to pursue their research. When they raise money and funds, they can keep it 
in their departments where their expertise is, and it doesn't go out um, to do uh, to go other places. And so decentralization has increased the excellence of the academic uh, mission. The key is really to be able to leverage the size of the institution to get economies of scale, to have shared services that make sense. But the only way to do that effectively is you really have to have robust conversations with the faculty about how to do the shared services. And uh, we had a mishap um, that I think we've all acknowledged that um, that, that did not happen. Um, and my understanding is it's happening better now. And if it's not, I want people to tell me that it's not. Because um, uh, what we have to do is find ways to save uh, save money where redundancy, redundancies do not make sense. But sometimes we don't only make business decisions, we make decisions that will enhance the academic quality. And that is the important part of our mission as well. Thank you, Ms. White. Mr. Beam. Uh, I think this is an area where there can be a lot of improvement. I uh, served on a cultural center board with a much smaller budget, a $50 million budget, but there were uh, a music school, uh, an art institute, uh, which were next door in proximity, and they, of course, all thought that they didn't share uh, any services with one another until it was brought to their attention that many things, from their health care plan to everything that they purchased, uh, and those were examples of shared services. I think uh, this takes uh, a lot of communication between uh, the different parts of the university, and when you have the communication, then you, you can find where there is duplication and redundancies uh, that can be fixed. Um, you also mentioned uh, just cost reductions uh, in general, uh, just with attending school. Uh, a close friend of mine, his uh, daughter uh, is a sophomore here, uh, last year took sociology, bought her text, went to class. The first thing the professor said is, I'm sorry if you bought the text, you won't be needing it this term. Uh, and uh, he was going to teach uh, with technology. Uh, I think when you look at it, it's a, a sixth of the price of tuition, uh, the cost of books uh, to attend the university per semester. Uh, if you have a tablet and we get out in front when it comes to licensing uh, text material on your tablet, we could save uh, millions. Thank you. Dr. Steele. Yeah, clearly the recent uh, attempt at, at the centralization process didn't work well, and I think it's, it's part of the culture <clears throat> problem we have here and the lack of openness, transparency, and accountability that it needs to be improved dramatically between all the various stakeholders in this process. And clearly that's, you know, one of my main goals and issues here regarding public office hours and all those sorts of things. But um, we, we, we know that something like that has to happen, but it's truly a cultural problem. Uh, places like the university, which are under the purview of the regents and not under any other organization, according to the state constitution, and higher, higher education and academics in general, they've, they've uh, been op used to operating in a certain way, kind of think of like medicine, what the rapid upheaval that's going on, I can tell you as a practicing physician, uh, there's lots of things happening that I don't think are helpful or good, but they're happening, and, but there are some things that are happening that are good. And I think here in higher education, we have to realize that there will be some changes coming here, and there will be a huge culture shift, and it will be a big change in the environment in which we all operate. Uh, and, and there's no question that, as a physician, I see a lot of patients who work here at the university. And uh, I'll tell you, I hear the stories from all the subcontractors and how much they overcharge the university relative to any other job. Uh, I can tell you that our students shouldn't be going into debt to have sushi chefs and wood-burning pizza ovens. Uh, that's not necessary when you have 50,000 uh, applications for six or 7,000 acceptances. So open uh, checkbook online, budget online, uh, zero-based balance budgeting. Thank you. And uh, Ms. White, you'll be the first to answer our next question, which will be our last que question. Following the candidates' responses to this last question, they will each be given an opportunity to make a closing statement. They have two minutes to make that statement. All right, so Ms. White, you will be first on this question. What is your opinion on what the recent controversy involving Brady Hoke and Dave Brandon reveals about accountability in our athletic programs? How would you approach such a controversy as a region? <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, I actually can't, uh, I can't answer that question as easily as the other 
candidates because I'm actually currently the chair of the board and I can't speak um, without sounding like I'm speaking uh, for the board. Um, what I can say is um, it is very important that our student athletes are, um, are safe and that we have policies in place to ensure their safety. Also, it is very important that um, you know that all of the, the entire board, we are all very concerned about this issue and are listening to everything we're hearing from many constituents. And the president of the university actually is the one who makes the personnel decisions. Um, and we are, um, uh, as part of our role, individually we consult with the president. But I feel it would be difficult for me to um, answer this in a way that doesn't trigger New York Times headlines. <laughs> It would be more fun. <laughs> Mr. Beam. Uh, I, I, I meant to be funny the other day when I said to someone who asked me this question, I think you could raise tuition 25% and receive less outcry uh, than as to regarding uh, the concussion issue with regard to Shane Morris. Um, he looked at me, he didn't laugh, and he sort of had to look like, so what's your point? Um, so he was very involved in this issue. Um, the, this is something that a parent, any of us, when you send your child to school, if your child's on the football team, the field hockey team, or just your average student, your number one concern is your child's safety. Uh, and that for many uh, parents, this is the first time their child's left the home is to go to school. And so this is something that is of the utmost importance, um, not being a regent and not uh, being at the meetings. Sometimes people ask us financial questions and you, you have to preface your answer by saying, I don't have access to the books. Um, but here, I can tell you uh, as a fan and as an alum, uh, I was incredibly disappointed uh, with how it was handled uh, and um, I would look uh, for a thorough investigation uh, so something like this uh, does not happen again. Thank you. Dr. Steele. Yeah, I, I agree with some of the comments that Mr. B made. Uh, you know, in medicine, you don't, you, know, you don't come to a diagnosis and a treatment until you have all the data, and I certainly don't have all the data regarding the specifics inside that perhaps, you know, Regent White has available. Um, Certainly the medical side is a, of grave concern, and I, I think we've heard from the athletic department they've instituted many new, new policies to uh, help overcome the challenge they had, uh, which was, was pretty disappointing. Um, you know, as regards, you know, football, I mean, we, we got to understand here at the University of Michigan, we are first and foremost a fantastic, highly honored research institution with a fantastic history and athletics clearly is not the primary focus of this university. And I, I have a little different view on that than many. My grandfather started three years for Fielding Yost and played on a, started on a national championship team. And after his long career in public education, actually is a member of the National Collegiate Athletic Directors Hall of Fame. So when we look at some of these issues, they're the kind of things that, that I have great passion for. But let's also look at the athletic department if we want to look in and evaluate. Let's keep in mind that there are 30, 31 sports. Uh, they're doing extremely well in all the others. The facilities have had tremendous upgrade. And uh, so far, um, the, the athletic department uh, has challenges with fees and, and with this medical decision, but uh, let's not forget we're a research university uh, here to help the future of the state and not an athletic program. Thank you. Mr. Weiser. Well, first of all, uh, what Regent White said is important. It's the president of the university's responsibility together with the executive officers to determine whether what the problem is, if there is one, and what the proper action is to take. University regions have a responsibility to give their input. Uh, and after they've given their input, they also have the responsibility to support the actions of the president. And quite frankly, after time, if they don't support the actions of presidents, that's why presidents or executive officers get replaced. So this is not just about one incident. This is about policies. It's about traditions, 
It's about the direction of the athletic department, but more importantly, about the interaction between the athletic department and the university community. And looking at all those things together, I, if I was a region, I certainly would give my input. I would certainly give my opinions, but they would be given to the president of the university, and from there, the support of that president's decisions, I think, is important for the regions to, to do. All right, that concludes our questions. We're now going to have the closing statements from each of the candidates. Again, the order in which they give them was determined prior to uh, the forum. So we will be starting with Mr. Weiser, your closing statement, please, sir. Why am I running for regent? Because I think I can make a difference. I've had that opportunity throughout my life. My background is as first as a businessman starting a, a small company when I was in school with $300 and growing it into a larger company. Having the opportunity then to go into public service 25 years ago and to go into full-time public service 15 years ago. And having the opportunity during that time to make a difference. This university is a leader in research. It is a leader in educational excellence. It has to and has a duty to continue to impact on the quality of life for the human existence. And it can do those things, and it can do them better. And it can do those through its faculty, through its research, but most importantly through its students. So there's many, many things that interact. And I believe I have a set of characteristics and background that can help with that whether it's being a diplomat and working within a bureaucracy and understanding how that process works to get people to work together to solve problems. I was in Eastern Europe right after 9-11. Uh, whether it is my background in nonprofits, I've chaired multiple nonprofits over the years from the Michigan Theater to United Negro College Fund to New Center and on and on and on. And I've learned that individual institutions can have an impact. Here at the university, I was one of the founders of the Ginsburg Center for Service and Learning as the person from the outside working with the Vice President of Student Affairs and the, the Vice Pre and, and the Provost to help that start. That was an impact that has had a big impact on many students and others who received those services. Weiser, Weiser Center for International, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for, of Europe and Eurasia and the Weiser Center for um, can't even remember my own centers. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, we're going to emerging have to democracies. Ask you, we're going to have to ask you to stop. Mr. Working with the International Institute. So those are things that I have experience in doing, and and I hope I have the opportunity to do that with the university as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Beam. Thank you, Sue. And thanks uh, for putting this uh, forum together today. It's been a good discussion. Um, I, we've all talked about things we would want to improve, and I think we do need to keep in mind, uh, you know, the recent publications. Uh, where U of M is ranked uh, the top public university in the world. So there is a great deal uh, to be proud of. Uh, that being the case, you can always improve. And I think there are uh, some areas uh, that the university can improve, not only improve, but continue to lead and lead into the future. Um, uh, I believe my background uh, in being a trial attorney and also uh, working on the boards that I have, uh, like Ambassador Weiser said, uh, gives me uh, some great experience in a situation like this when it comes to uh, dealing with people uh, with different opinions. Uh, I am a firm believer of the more voices, the better. Uh, and so when it comes to making decisions, uh, I would regularly meet, uh, like I mentioned before, with uh, people from uh, all different branches here in the university, from students to faculty, uh, and that tails right into what we were talking about with the Open Meetings Act. Uh, and that's something that I find incredibly uh, important and worthy uh, to pursue uh, from, both an from both an academic and athletic standpoint uh, that we need to bring in uh, more voices and hear more voices, frankly. Uh, sometimes decisions seem to be tone deaf, uh, and I get the feeling that those are decisions that are made by few people instead of the, uh, receiving the opinions uh, of many people. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm really the only candidate from outstate, uh, and uh, I would work uh, tirelessly to you know, promote and protect the interests of both 
uh, branch campuses in addition to uh, the main campus here in Ann Arbor. Thank you. Ms. White? Well, as the current chair of the Board of Regents, I have experience and expertise on the board. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering, Electrical Engineering, Computer Science uh, from Princeton University. I have a law degree from University of Washington. I have a Master of Law in George, from George Washington University Law School, and I just graduated from the U.S. Army War College with a Master in Strategic Studies. I'm currently a professor of law at Wayne State University. Um, I specialize in patent law. I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army uh, Reserve in the JAG Corps, which is the Lawyer's Corps for the military. I teach constitutional and military law to the cadets at West Point in the summers. And I'm a registered patent attorney, Fulbright Senior Scholar, and I was a White House Fellow during 9-11. Um, I have a background that's very different from anyone currently on the board. I'm the only one that's served in the military. I'm the only engineer. Um, and um, I'm the only academic. And I think it's important to have academics on the board. Um, the state of Michigan is transforming, right? We're still dealing with this transformation from manufacturing economy to knowledge economy. We have um, a lot of challenges as a nation, and higher education is a big piece of those challenges. And my background gives me a solid foundation to lead the University of Michigan through these changing times. Thank you. Dr. Steele? Thank you, everyone, for coming. Great questions. You see you've got a lot of qualified candidates up here. It's great to be here in the Ford School, strangely. I grew up in Grand Rapids, another outstate guy, and uh, when Gerald Ford announced his first race for the House, it was in my <coughs> grandparents' living room, and that furniture is in the uh, Ford Museum, and my gr mom modeled with Betty Bloomer, so the, the Ford uh, family's been a long time with us, and, and uh, it's, it's just wonderful that the uh, university has recognized uh, his accomplishments and contributions to the university. Uh, I mentioned my medical background. 55% of the budget at the university is the Health Center of Medical Education and Clinical NIH Research. And uh, with all due respect to my flanking members here, there are seven attorneys on the board and no research physicians. Um, so we have some work to do there. I, I think I have a lot to contribute there as well as to the institutional memory. I mentioned my grandfather with a long history here. My grandmother was chair of the Con Committee for Continuing, of educa Continuing Education for Women, was the first woman to have a, an alumni group named after her, and was a national co-chair for the first endowment came campaign in 1964. And in the mid-1950s, she was uh, sharing the stage with Harlan Hatcher during an event when some of the question came from the audience is, what about our qualified students that aren't getting into the University of Michigan? And in 1955, Harlan Hatcher's answer was, we will never turn down a qualified student from the state of Michigan. We will always increase enrollment to make sure they're taken care of. We need to make sure that the University of Michigan does more to contribute to the future of the state of Michigan by making sure our highly qualified students are accepted. We need to make sure that the qualified students from out of state are encouraged to stay here by giving them tuition refunds to STEM degrees if they stay in the state for five years and pay tuition. We want to recruit the very best of students to stay here at the university after they graduate. And uh, I'll be happy to make my contributions on the board when it comes to the crazy changes that are happening in medicine, research, and limited funds coming from both federal and state government. Thank you for being here. I want to thank the candidates for coming this afternoon and participating in this lively discussion. I want to thank all of you in the audience who provided questions of important issues facing the university. And I want to thank the Ford School, Dean Collins, for co-sponsoring the event so that we could have it here in this lovely facility. There will be a reception following the forum, and I invite all of you to stand, to stay, and to talk uh, uh, individually with the candidates as they are able to stay. Thank you very much. Don't forget to vote. <laughs>